Good afternoon, all. My name is Karthik Ayer, and I'm the National Business Development Manager for Schneider Electric. Um, thanks for your time. Um, uh, nice to be here. Trust all of you had a good morning session, got to meet a few new people. Um, my session this afternoon is about energy efficient cooling solution for your data centers, small, medium, and large. With data centers that have evolved rapidly in the last couple of years and will keep evolving. And a primary reason for the evolution of data centers is the way we use internet today. Ordering pizzas, movie tickets, book a, a table in a, book a table in a restaurant. It's all through your mobile device through internet. The topics I'll be touching on are basically mega trends, strain on power, uh, talking about energy efficient cooling solutions for small, medium, and large data centers, and indirect air economizer. If you've attended the sessions this morning, a key thing that uh, Gareth pointed out was the energy consumption in, inside a data center. If you've got to be efficient, it's got to come down by three. Joe spoke about being efficient and innovative in how we take care of these data centers. And Andrew touched upon energy hogs in a data center. So there are two energy hogs, one being the UPS and the other being cooling system. And in a cooling system, there's compressors, which consume a lot of power. Through this presentation, I'll take you through ways and means we can reduce the power for small, medium, and large sort of data centers. Three questions that I'll try and cover as I go through the presentation, and we'll come and revisit these questions at the end of the presentations. They are, how can I make my, how can I make my data centers more efficient? This is small, medium, and large. What are the types of cooling solutions for small, medium, and large data centers? And what are the advantages of using indirect air uh, economization over um, your open air, uh, open air economization? Starting off with megatrends. You must have seen this slide again. This is probably a repeat of what you, have, what you have seen this morning. We expected to build, in the next 40 years, as many cities we have built since the beginning of humanity. Think again the amount of stress on infrastructure, on transportation. If you think Sydney and Melbourne is busy today, peak hour, think again. A lot of power consumption. We've got digitalization everywhere, at home, coffee shop, in your offices. We expected to add about 50 billion more devices in the next three to five years. Again, a lot of internet traffic, a lot of data consumption, a lot of data storage, a lot of power consumption. If you look at Internet of Things, it's, it's the ability of Internet where everyday items have the ability to transmit and receive data. Your iWatch, mobile, all the devices you carry today. Again, we consume, transmit a lot of data. All this data is getting stored somewhere, and there's power to drive this data and keep them cool. We're not far away from seeing a revolution on the road. It's not when, it's not if, it's a matter of time. Once a, driverless, once a driverless car hits the road, the amount of data the car will consume is about two gigabytes a minute to, be, to keep the car on the road. With all the controversies around, that's, that's, uh, you know, it's sort of coming. That's per car, two, two gigabytes a minute per car times the number of cars on the road. Again, a lot of data consumption, a lot of internet traffic, a lot of power consumption. That we know where the power is trading, where your consumption is going in your internet, what's happening to power? The power that's already strained. It depends on which IT magazine you read, which internet server you participate in. The amount of power consumption in a data center is about 25 to 38%. This is pure cooling power consumption. This is your crack units, your cooling towers, your chillers. And this is what you see today. If you look at futuristic data consumption, this is just going to go up. So looking at the way the energy consumption is currently now and the future load on data centers, the Australian government data center strategy put together a white paper. This is to make existing and future data centers more efficient. If I've got to pick key three topics in the white paper that's, that, makes data, that can make data center more efficient in regards to cooling, they are to have a flexible operating mode. If you, ask what, if you ask me what a flexible operating mode is, this is where the air conditioning system or your cooling solution in the room has the ability to be able to use 
100% outside air, which is also referred to as free cooling, or part outside air to offset the mechanical cooling, thereby reducing your power consumption of your mechanical cooling, which is compressors. Some form of containment, hot or cold, which will make, a, which will make the rooms more efficient. And third is increase the data center temperature from the traditional 22 degrees return, which, which is what most of you uh, who have been in this industry have, uh, are used to. I was a service engineer when I started my career. Uh, if you walk into a data center, you're probably walking with a jumper because it's about 22 degrees. Today, you can, you, can, you can think of 24, 28, 29 degrees. It depends on how robust your servers are. So if it's a possibility, increase those, increase those temperatures high to, to make the room efficient. Higher the, higher the room temperature, more efficient is your cooling solution. Now looking at where the internet is trading in terms of data on, data on the internet, the storage, and the power consumption today, what do we have in terms of energy efficient cooling solutions from, from Schneider Electric for small, medium, and large data centers to make your existing and new rooms more efficient? If I start with DX crack units, DX crack units have been around for a very long time, you know, probably 30, 40 years old if you ask me. However, the modern DX crack units come with what we call as a variable speed brushless DC compressors. Very, very efficient. These compressors can vary the cooling capacity between 20 and 100 percent. These compressors have the ability of varying the cooling capacity based on your room load sensors that pick up the temperature at the end of the crack unit or at the inlet of the server rack. As the load in the room drops, which is, an, which is expected you know, during the day or night, the compressors will ramp down, thereby reducing the power on the, on the grid. With radical composite EC fans, which are low on power for the same or higher amount of external static pressure, these fans can support. This is much, much efficient compared to your legacy bell-driven fan or even a standard EC fan. If your rooms have uh, the ability to drop the fan under the flow cavity, which is a high raised flow, these fans can draw less power, even less power. Fan speed management is the ability of the fan to be able to track or vary the fan speed based on the compressor speed or the cooling capacity. This is in a DX system. There was a time when you could vary the fan speed only for chill water system, but today, with the systems we sell, we can have the fan speed varying based on the compressor speed. So as the load in the room goes down, your compressor speed will ramp down, so will the fan speed. EC condenser fans, more efficient. Your condenser fans are a component in a DX crack unit that operate 24 seven. Having an EC condenser fan means low on power. Adding a, if you add a direct free cooling module on the crack unit, this gives the ability for the crack unit to be able to draw air from the outside, which is also referred to as free cooling. When the, ambient degrees is couple of de when the ambient is a couple of degrees below the room condition. Lower ambient means higher free cooling. As you, as you engage free cooling, you use less compressors, so low power consumption. If engineered properly in a containment, these systems can be 20% more efficient compared to your legacy system, and the operating cost can be as low as about 25%. If you look at, if you look at chilled water cracks, Again, going away from the traditional sort of chill water cracks where the entering water conditions, if you're from, um, if you're from the mechanical side, they were about seven degrees. Today, these systems can take, take, take in chill water temperatures ranging from seven to about 20 degrees. A big variation. Higher the chill water temperature, lower is your load on the chiller, lower is the power consumption. Why is it relevant? As your load in the room drops, you don't have to go 100% seven degree in a chill water temperature. You can back off the chill water and back off the chiller. However, your indoor units or your room cooling solutions need to have the ability to be able to take a higher chill water temperature, which is possible. Again, these chill water crack units can come with vertical composite EC fans, underflow modules, direct free cooling modules, and built-in flow meters that gives the IT user the ability to see the flow of, of the unit on the display. If engineered properly, these systems can be 32% more efficient and 23% lower on operating cost. The systems are available between six kilowatt, which is the smallest unit, and go as high as 120 kilowatts in terms of cooling capacity. There's about 50 modules in between. So it fits in small, medium, large data centers. Close couple cooling, which is also referred to as in-row 
in-row cooling solution where you take the cooling solution close to your heat load, thereby obviously reducing the power, um, thereby reducing the power consumption. If it's a DX system, you can have a variable speed brushless DC compressors, which gives the ability for the in-row cooling solution to vary the cooling capacity. Hot swappable EC fans, low on power. Real-time display of cooling and current on the touchscreen panel, no different to, a, to your iPhone, where you can see the, uh, the user has the ability to see on the screen the power consumption and the cooling consumption of your in-row cooling. There can be remote sensors that can be deployed in the aisle that can vary the cooling capacity and the fan speed based on what the server inlet rack temperature is. Very, very efficient because you're going away from supply return directly to the, um, to the racks. If engineered properly, obviously I missed a point there. If it's a chilled water system, uh, the cooling, the chilled water to the unit can vary between 7 and 20 degrees, exactly like the crack units. If engineered properly, these systems can be 30% low, lower on operating cost in a containment solution. Very, very efficient, and this is, this is a comparison done, done against a traditional in-row chilled water system. Well, not too far away is what we call as technical chillers. These chillers are different to the chillers used by buildings for cooling comfort or human bodies. Technical chillers are capable of operating the chilled water condition between the traditional seven degrees to 20 degrees. Again, why is it relevant? If you've got your room solution, which is crack units and indoor cooling, that can vary the inlet temperature from seven to 20, you need to have a chiller on the roof, and those chillers can vary the cooling water temperature um, to the in-row in units or to your crack units. Higher, higher the chilled water temperature, lower is the power consumption. This chilled water come with air, they can be air or water cool. What we have is air cool with, with variable speed brushless DC compressors. These compressors can engage and de-engage -eng and, and get de-engaged as your cooling load in the room increases or decreases. They come with built-in variable speed pumps, which is chilled water pumps. They come with, they come with built-in water tanks. What this do is they, what this, what this does is this reduces your capital cost because your chilled water pumps and your water tanks are built in within the chiller. Once your chiller capacity exceeds your 100 kilowatts, you can have something called a free cooling chiller where you use ambient air to partially compensate mechanical cooling. Once your chiller capacity exceeds 300 kilowatts, you can have what we call as adiabatic chillers. And I've got a couple of slides to, to explain what adiabatic, adiabatic chiller or adiabatic solution is. The capacities we carry is between six kilowatts, that is the smallest chiller, which all these features built in to up to 1.1 megawatt of chiller, and there's about 50 models in between. That, ladies and gents, brings us to one of the latest addition to the Schneider cooling portfolio. EcoFlare is a, a direct air economization designed for large data centers and colos. This forms under the part of, this forms under the innovation, innovative product that we've launched this year. These chillers are designed for large colos, as I mentioned. 250 and 500 kilowatt is the cooling modules we have today with plans to launch smaller modules towards the end of this year. These chillers sit outside the white space, so not inside the data center. What it means is it saves the IT manager, your customers, IT users, to be able to use this space to add more racks. Indirect air, indirect air, to, air, indirect air to air economization. What it means is air from the IT room is part cooled by ambient air, which is also referred to as free cooling. However, the air streams don't mix. The biggest advantage of this is we could use the system on free cooling irrespective of the quality of air. Moist air, the air, air with dust, fumes, we can still use it on free cooling. A big contrast to using a system with sort of direct free cooling where the moment the air quality is bad, you, you stop using free cooling. And I've got another slide to explain this in a bit more detail. The system is designed in a way that up to 40% of the room load is cooled by free cooling. So it could be anywhere between 40 and 100 can be, can be free cooled, and the, balance is by, and the balance is by mechanical cooling, which is, again, um, by brushless variable speed DC compressors, which means the compressors can engage and de-engage as the load goes up or down inside the server room. Adiabatic cooling. If I go to quickly capture what this concept is of actually adiabatic cooling, this is the process of adding or spraying water to the air that enters the system. 
when you add water to dry bulb, the dry bulb, the dry bulb temperature drops close to the wet bulb thereby giving you, the enable, giving, you the, giving you the capability to be able to use hot, dry air for free cooling. Again, I've got a slide to explain this in a bit more detail. It's no different to what you see here. This is the best picture I could get to get, you know, to get your attention. So if we ignore the lady on the picture, that's adiabatic cooling, what she's doing. She's got a fan in her hand, a little water pot attached to the fan. The moment you press the water, water is sprayed onto the fan and that drops the dry bulb close to the wet bulb. And that's basically adiabatic cooling, obviously properly engineered in, uh, in the EcoFly units we sell. I, spend, I take a minute again to explain what maximum availability is. The, the ability of the system to have isolated airstream, which means the air from the IT room does not mix with the air, with the ambient air, gives the system the ability to be able to use free cooling irrespective of the quality of air. So you can install this system anywhere in the globe and you should be able to use it on free cooling any, any type of air outside. The ability, to have, the ability to have adiabatic cooling enables the system to be able to use free cooling irrespective of the temperature of the air. To just put this into perspective, on a hot, um, a typical summer day anywhere in Australia, let's take the east coast, Brizzy, could be 35 degrees. On that, on that particular day, if you add water to that temperature, the wet bulb depression between the dry bulb and the wet bulb is expected to be about, it's expected to be about, about 15 degrees, which means you can drop the dry bulb right close to the wet bulb and, and, use, the, and use the system for free cooling. This picture will make a, make a bit more sense of what I'm explaining. Air from the IT room, which is air from the right-hand side or left-hand side, the way you look at it, um, is ducted back to the EcoFlare. This is air at hot aisle temperature from the IT room. This air is channelized through a set of filters, through a set of coils, five to 7,000 tubes that form a part of a, uh, um, that forms a part of a polymer heat exchanger, which is the green body in between. The, this heat exchanger enables the ambient air that falls, flows over the heat exchanger, no contact whatsoever, and it's actually sucked from the top thereby enabling a heat transfer. So no contact, just heat transfer. The air that leaves the eco flare is expected to be at about the temperature that you need in the cold aisle. If there is a gap, the mechanical top-up cooling, which is variable speed brushless DC compressors, kick in at that point to just compensate the load. The system is designed in a way that at any given point of time, any global locations, the maximum amount of free cooling is 40. I mean, the minimum amount of free cooling is 40. You can have anywhere between 40 and 100. Lower the ambient temperature, more is the use of free cooling. That's all well and good when the ambient temperature is lower than the air inside your hot oil temperature. Typically, hot oil temperature can be anywhere between 34 to 37, to about 37 degrees. When the ambient, ambient temperature is higher or closer to the air that's entering the eco flare, we turn on what we call as adiabatic cooling, spraying water at the point where the air enters the eco flare and on the heat exchanger, drops the dry bulb temperature close to the wet bulb, which ensures that the system can use free cooling all through the year. 60% lower on operating cost compared to your legacy chilled water system and PUEs, which is measured in, on a site in England, close to 1.039, which is sort of unheard when you look at cooling large data centers. That, ladies and gents, brings us to the question that I had at the start of the presentation. How can I make my data centers more efficient? Opt for cooling technologies, DX, chilled water, that has the ability to follow the room loads, going away from the traditional way where the systems went on and off based on the return air temperature on the crack unit. Now we follow what's happening inside the load, inside the crack, inside the server, and we vary the cooling capacity. What are the types of cooling solutions for small, medium, and large data centers, small and medium data centers, sorry? DX and chilled water crack units, in-row cooling solutions, and technical chillers. So technical chillers, again, very relevant. If you've got space issue, chillers as small as six kilowatts are available today. And there's about 50 models, as I said, between six and 1.1 megawatts. These chillers can be deployed to marry with the in-row or room cooling solution. 
and what are the advantages of using indirect air economization. Having an isolated airstream, which enables the system to be able to use free cooling, irrespective of the quality of air, and having an adiabatic system, which enables the system to use free cooling, irrespective of the ambient, ambient temperature, enables the system to use this all through the year. That's, that, ladies and gents, is the latest cooling technologies, energy efficient for small, medium, and large data centers. I'm looking at the clock here. I'm, I'm against time. If there's any questions, I need to be take, I should take it at the foyer. Is that right? Thank you.